Welcome to Releasing Your Inner Dragon, where story creators talk story creation. Drake is an award-winning fantasy novelist and creative writing teacher. You can find his epic fantasy series, The Genesis Oblivion, on Kindle Vela. Marie runs a fantasy world-building channel called Just In Time World, and her first book, The Hidden Blade, is available on Kindle Unlimited. We hope you enjoy this episode. Now, I would like to discuss mentor characters. How to introduce them, how to use them, how to write them out of the story if you need to, or how to ignore them if you still want to have them in the story, like if you don't just want to kill them. And the reason why I want to discuss mentor characters is because I really am tired of reading the classic coming of age story where farm boy meets mentor character who somehow becomes more important than his family in like a day of meeting him. Yeah, and we talked it, about that earlier. <laughs> with yeah. whole Obi-Wan Kenobi. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Kill, my parents are dead, but you can't kill Obi. I just met him. Ah. Um, and then the mentor character dies and that, you know, provides the motivation for the hero and off they go. Like, And because all of the YAs do that. Or without fail. Well, let, let's take a step back mm. because, you know, obviously this is very integral to the hero's journey side of it. The hero's journey mentor is, is going to be used a lot, but I want to go back even further and kind of lay the groundwork of even why, why a mentor character exists, why it's important, why they are needed in some stories um, and why, especially in sci-fi and fantasy, fantasy even more so than sci-fi they are so desperately needed and it really comes down to a term called an anchor character so all stories have anchor characters what an anchor character is is it anchors the reader to the world Hmm. and so what what that means is is that they don't anchor characters don't know something And so they have to ask. So let's say, you know, we're meeting fairies for the first time and fairies only eat honey. We don't want to write the line. Rin said to Tin, hey, Tin, remember, we're fairies and we only eat honey. So don't eat anything but honey. Yeah. Because Tin would go, yeah, thanks for reminding me about that, Rin. I've been a fairy my whole freaking life. I'd love to have a cheeseburger once in a while, you jerk. Like, it's the same thing as if, if I said, hey, Marie, remember, while we're doing this podcast, we're both humans and you got to breathe air or you'll die. So go ahead and make sure you're breathing air while we're doing this podcast. Like that's that's insane dialogue. Nobody would say that. So the the reality is, is that you have an anchor character. So maybe somebody is meeting these fairies for the first time and they're like, hey, would you like a cheeseburger? And Tin's like, no, I, I'd love to have one, but we'll die if we eat anything but honey. Really? That's crazy. You can only eat honey? You've never had anything but honey? That's all I've ever eaten. Just honey. Yeah, it sucks. I'd love to eat a cheeseburger. Like, because now that's organic mm. because the character doesn't know. And so they're called an anchor because they anchor the reader to the world. And when it's a secondary or tertiary character that's an anchor, who cares? Like you can have a secondary character that's an idiot that never grows. That's just an idiot from start to finish. The problem is, is with the hero's journey, what you get a lot of is you get the protagonist is an anchor character, which is why farm boy is such a overused trope. But think about it. From, from a logical standpoint, it makes perfect sense. I have this whole gigantic fantasy world that I want to you know, show to the reader and let them experience and let them learn and let them grow and, and, and discover this. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to put them in the shell of a character who also has never experienced it. It's one of the reasons why The Strange New World is also a part of the, um, the, 
the hero's journey because we're going to move from the world that is the normal world like harry potter he's in my world oh i get all that i know what a cupboard on the stairs looks like i know what the oh wait he's in dagon alley what's this this is a whole new thing and he has to ask lots of questions and he's like whoa that that broom can fly the the, the cards like oh no my my playing card the person left my playing card well of course they did they've got other cards being they can't just be in yours like he's the anchor. He doesn't know anything. And so he's got to ask questions. And then organically, the audience gets the answers to those questions without some crappy, remember we're elfins and elfins can only eat honey. Like that's, you don't want to do crap like that. And so really the, the, the next logical step is, and the reason why mentors are so prevalent is I've got a character who literally cannot overcome this story. He's a freaking moron. He's not going to survive. Yeah. Like we can't just let him go out and fight dragons because he'll just become dragon meal. Hmm. Like, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to pair him up with somebody who's got a little bit of, a little bit of experience, a little bit more, some, someone who can answer some of those questions and grow him with the skills that he needs. So it's a logical step. Like there's, there's literally nothing wrong. So I, I understand. I understand the, the logical step. I guess like, that's one of the reasons why, though, I didn't put in a mentor character and I didn't pick a farm boy. You know, my my MC is at the height of his of his abilities. Right. Um, it made my world. And you didn't, and you didn't baby me on your world. No, you allowed him to know what he knew, and you just kind of expected me to catch up. Yeah. And that's the way you do that. And that's a great, when I'm writing characters, like my characters never think or say about anything they already know. Yeah. It, like I don't, if, if I was writing a story where I'm going to go to the grocery store, I am, I'm going to, you know, Drake went downstairs, picked up his car keys, walked out the door, locked the door, got in his car and drove to the like i'm not going to be like what is a car and what are car keys and what's a house door look like and and like what is a gas pedal and how do things like i'm not going to describe any of that because i already know all that and even if that's magical even if i even if the story was i went and locked my front door hopped on my dragon and flew to the grocery store if it's my mundane everyday job then I'm not going to describe that for the readers because it's stupid. It's, yeah. it's It would be insulting. They're just going to have to catch up. They're just going to have to go, oh, well, I, I, I guess he takes a dragon to the grocery store every time he goes. Like, I guess it's just normal. You yeah. know, I'm going to pass other people on dragons as I'm flying over there. Like, and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that to build that world, but I'm not going to baby you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's also the reason why I do have anchor characters. You know, yeah. people, I mean, in Genesis Saga, there is a farm boy. Yeah. You know, he's one of five characters, though. But I do a lot of world building in his stories because I can organically do it. And I, and I do strategically position some of his chapters to where I'm like, oh, I'm going to be flying a dragon to the grocery store. This guy's done it a billion times, but my anchor hasn't. So let me do a chapter where he's asking all these questions, you know, do a scene that, that moves everything I need, but also adds in you know, those elements that I need the reader to get in this world building thing. So that when I get into the next chapter, I don't have to waste that time. The guy already knows everything or the girl already knows everything. And she's just going to do her thing without even thinking about it. Of course, she's flying a dragon to, to go buy groceries. That's what you do. And so, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's all about thinking about that stuff. So, so I agree with you that it's important if your anchor character doesn't know anything. Oh, I'm not saying you have to use them. I'm just yeah. giving you, I just want to start with the base of why, yeah, yeah. That's why they were used and what, and now why they've been overused and poorly used. And because that's really your point is that they're yeah. overused, they're poorly used. And I agree with all of that. Because, because like I, I'm, I'm with you on why I'm intric- I mean, in fact, some of the best stories that I've read have been coming of age stories with them. Yeah. Some of the, the, the truly iconic stories that I remember, some of the, my favorite author, Jacqueline Carey, the first book has a mentor character who dies. Like, it's the classic, right? <laughs> um, and yet, 
it doesn't like that doesn't feel tired and overused because it because you become invested in the mentor character. But if I think even of Star Wars, which I know we have a difference of opinion here, I, I like Star Wars quite a bit. <laughs> but if I think of Star Wars, like Obi-Wan Kenobi, we had very little time to get invested in that character. Yep. There was very and little. That did not impact the audience at the level that it impacted Luke. And since Luke is a proxy stand-in for the audience, it creates this weird, wait, why is he freaking out like that? He met the dude yeah. like two years ago. So yeah. it, it, it hurts the story. Yeah. So I guess let's talk about that. Let's talk about getting mentors. Well, so I, don't, I don't usually do this, <laughs> but I am going to use what I think is one of the best examples of it. Sure. Is, is from my Genesis of Oblivion Saga. I don't usually use my own writing for this stuff, but I, I do. I, I love I, the, I got more, I, I call it hate mail. It's not really hate mail, but I got more hate mail off of when I killed the mentor character than anything else. You know, so many people wrote me in or like, I'm so mad at you for doing this. I'm so mad at you. It, you know, the, the one story that I tell all the time where this, this woman asked for a personal apology because she was reading the book and made an, a, a fool of herself in public because she yeah. stood up and screamed no at the top of her lungs when she was sitting in Starbucks yeah. uh, because she had totally was a totally engrossed in the story and totally forgot that she was reading a book. You know, that's that's the, the mentor's death scene. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from a story standpoint, that character is a mentor. Yeah. He, he's in the story only to be a mentor and he's going to die when he dies that's it but how i hit it is i don't roll him out as a mentor you actually meet him as a main character mm. he is a pov character he's got he's got a thematic elements he's got a story arc he's got motivations and drives and he's doing his thing and the, i also hit it a little bit because he doesn't so a mentor character one of the tropes is is they're going to come along and they don't really have anything except for the protagonist so obi-wan doesn't isn't trying to overthrow the the empire he's trying to teach luke to overthrow the empire yeah. that's his thing and with with this character he didn't give a shit about the protagonist character yeah. he's got his thing that he's doing mm -hmm. and that's the other thing is, is since he dies his story arc is cut mm -hmm. it's literally left unfulfilled sort of the the his mentee character ends up picking that up and that becomes his, his story. And that's another way that I hit it is the mentee character, the main protagonist doesn't have a story arc until the mentor dies. So that's another thing that I use to hide the fact that, that, that it was an actual mentor mentee relationship. You know, you have to, you have to read these books because as you're describing the Genesis saga, it comes home to me that every word that you've said about how you hit the mentor character it is true for Kashil Start. Because the mentor character has all the motivation. The mentee character, until his death, has none. Yeah. That's <laughs> sad that somebody else also did that, but <laughs> I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. So it's not like I'm going to be unique and come up yeah. with with the only no, 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 but it's just like it and it actually reminds me of why like that particular mentor death mattered to me, right because yeah. until that point the mentor death was dry and when the mentor died it felt as though the entire story had just, i was like what yeah no, wait what yeah what now <laughs> you're like wait where does the story go from here yeah, yeah. how what? does this resolve itself yeah. And so, yeah, and that's exactly yeah. what I did. And, and I, and, you know, I'm proud of, of doing it so well, because, you know, I've mentioned this before, Patrick yeah. Labruto was the main editor on that, the editor for Isaac Asimov and Stephen King and Raymond Feist and all of those. And he didn't see it coming. Yeah. He said, he said, never, ever in my 35 year career has somebody done something that literally was shocking to me. Mm -hmm. um, because he was like, 
he was like, well, it's a magic world. You're going to use magic healing. He's not dead. He's not dead. You're not going to kill him. There's a wizard. There's a healer right there. You're going to heal. Heal him. What are you doing? Don't. No, he can't. Be. Like So as he's reading on and they're like, and because because I do have the healer there. The healer's like, yeah, there's nothing I can do. Because, you know, that's what you do. You you anticipate what the reader is going to gonna be wanting. Yeah. And so, and then you make the character do it. So the, the mentee character turns to the healer. It's like, you're a healer. You can do something. And he's like, yeah, I can't. It's too far. There's nothing I can do. Because yeah. I know that the reader is going to be thinking that too. And yeah. so it, it's all devious little planning on my part. But even Labruto is like, it's like, I want to reach through the book and just shake the healer. And like, no, you will heal him. You will save this guy. Um, and then, yeah. So, so I guess like there, there is a really core element, right? Is you make the reader care about the mentor character. Well, so, so that goes back to the same thing we're talking about with scenes. Yeah. The key is you make the reader care about everything they need to care about, yes. not just the mentor, mentor character. Yeah. Anything that they need to care about that you want to impact them. You don't want them to care about the tertiary bartender that says three copper pieces for the beer. You know, that's just a set dressing. Yeah. But the things that are important to the story, that are important to care about, they're important. The, the motivations, the thematic elements, you know, all of those things, that's how we do it is we make them care. So, yeah, that's what I did is I forced yeah. you to care about this character as if he's a protagonist. Yes. And then I just yank that out from you. And yeah. it is brutal. You and I do that often through that series with other different things. Um, not necessarily killing main characters. Yes. I'm not George Martin. Um, Cause I mean, look at, look at the, look at the juxtaposition of the George Martin deaths. When he kills off Ned Stark, it actually does have an impact on the reader because Ned Stark was the absolute best character ever created in that series all the way to the end. He's the only one that's the best character. So you kill yeah. him off in book one and, and it sucks, but by the fourth or fifth or sixth main character that's dead, you have now become numb. And so now as characters are introduced, you don't allow yourself to connect with them. Yeah. You don't, you know, because you know, their death is going to come and, and you just, you just stop it. So it does, in my opinion, it does the exact opposite of what it needs to do. It actually pushes the readers away from the story yeah. instead of being invested in it. Yeah, I agree. There, there comes a point where you're doing too much. When you're writing a mentor character, I think one of the critical mistakes that people make is they think of them as a mentor character and then it shows as a mentor character. I'll go a step further. Yeah. I think that's the big mistake they make with the antagonist. Yeah. They think of them as a villain and therefore they feel like a villain and they're two dimensional and they aren't as dynamic as they should be. It's the same thing. But 100% agree with you on the mentors. When you think of it as a mentor, you write as a mentor, and then it's a throwaway character that you know is going to die, and you don't care. Yeah. And so the, I don't care. The reader doesn't care. Yeah. And I mean, it's not even just mentor characters, because if I think of the authors that annoy me in that aspect, they have one, maybe two fleshed out characters. Maybe the main character and his main squeeze, I won't dignify it by calling it a love interest, Maybe those two are fleshed out. Everybody else is literally just a walking bag of tropes. The Lancer character is literally just a foil. The villain is two-dimensional. The mentor is just there to educate. <laughs> yeah. And it's generally an orphan. Like, because you can't be bothered to deal with parents. <laughs> well, and again, we I think we talked about this in, yeah, in another one. We did. <laughs> so there's, there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, but you don't have to kill them off to keep, to get them out of the, the story. Yeah. But it is it is one of the things. But but unfortunately, remember, the, the industries are also lemmings. So the industries are like, well, it's why hey, they've got to be orphans. I'm yeah. only going to buy and so there might be tons of people out there that are writing fantastic stories where they don't, they aren't orphans, but they're not being purchased. Yeah. They're just not being picked up uh, because the industry, that's why they're, that's why YA has gone insane with the first person present tense. 
yeah. even though it's the worst tense to write a story in, in my opinion. But it's gone lousy in it because they're like, well, that's obviously what they want. That's what's making it successful. Hunger Games is only successful because it was written in first person, present tense. Not that it had an interesting story and interesting characters and great motivations and great thematic elements and everything like that. None of that matters. And quite the interesting world, not, none of that. First person, present tense. That's, yep. that's it. So let's just buy a bunch of first person, yeah. present tense stories. I mean, I got a friend who um, lucked out on terrible writer, horrible writer, has made more money as a writer than me because it was the uh, it was it was at the end of the uh, or at the beginning of the twi- the um, the Fifty Shades of Grey, mm-hmm. and this person had also wrote a horrible, terrible porn vampire thing that was just horribly written. And she got a million dollar advance. Wow. Because they were buying up anything the same. And then finally, when it got after about a year or so of sitting in the publishing industry, they were like, this is really bad. Like, this is terrible. Yeah, but at and, that point, the advance has been bad. Right, never got published, yeah. never got released. <laughs> they just wasted a million dollars. Um, so this person has made more money <laughs> on any one project than I've ever made on any one project, but just, and, and as far as I know, still not published yeah. on anything. Uh, so man, vampire vampires annoy me. Like I don't get it. I, I, but that's, that's just me personally. I don't know if vampires turn you on good for you, but I'm like, how is something that crawls out of a grave sexy? I, I, I can't I can't get past that point. I'm like that's if you go with the traditional vampire bridge too far. <laughs> you know, the traditional vampires. If you go with the more Anne Rice, um, you never actually were in a grave, you were alive and then you're you know but you're dead. Sort of. Well, um it depends. I mean in, 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 and we're getting off the topic, but you get into like um oh what was the vampire porn uh that uh that you, they did on HBO or whatever. Um, you eat people. <laughs> like, oh, well, they get, they, but they, they, that's the thing. These new modern ones, they get around that stuff where they're like, oh, don't eat people. That. That's, that's like, that's like, that's like the author wants to write a fairy and call it a vampire because they want to right. like tap into the romantic. Right. Of right. Yeah. But you take the traditional vampire, which was the corpse that crawled out of the ground. It was emaciated and, and had to feed on human flesh to survive. And you go, okay, I want to use that, but I want them to, be, to have sex. So let's make them not emaciated in, in, in nasty corpses and let's make yeah. them not have to kill everybody that they do and yeah. let's make them, you know, you just basically change the trope uh, yeah. to fit your needs. And they took them from a complete horror monster to a romantic lead yeah um true blood i think it was true blood is the one true i was thinking blood. Suki. that the, vampire with that southern accent is like, yeah hello Suki. So, so so what is our key takeaway for mentors here if we're getting back to our mentors? well so I, I think it's pretty easy i think it's that you have to and it's not just mentors it's villains it's 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 all your other characters really your tertiary characters should feel real They should, they should feel, even if they're just going to be in it for a moment, you should do everything you can. Obviously you're not going to give their motivations, their life story. There's, you know, it's a bartender. It's a, it's a, you know, messenger. It's a whatever. They're tertiary characters for a reason. But the way I try to to think about them is they are the hero in their story. It's just that their story only intersected with my story, this one little moment. And then, and then it kept going on its heroic whatever because everybody's you know all of us are the heroes of our own story and that's what i try to treat them and so i think the the takeaway for the mentor character is don't think of just like you said don't think of them as a mentor character you know they have a job to do for the story but they you 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 want to breathe life in them it doesn't mean like with mine obviously they were a narrating character Mm -hmm. i brought them in as a point of view which which Narrating characters instantly have gravitas with your readers. So, you know, they instantly have that. They instantly have that with the reader, that authority. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have, you know, that's how, that's one of the ways that I I use to hide the fact that, that this one character was a mentor in the Genesis saga. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do that. You can still have a mentor secondary character 
but you still have to know that they have desires. They like no mentor character just wakes up one day and goes, you know what I want to do? I want to teach a farm boy how to fight with a sword. And then I want to get killed. Yeah. I really was like, really gruesomely too. Like if I could really have a really horrible, gruesome death that, because that would really impact the character, you know, that, that, that farm boy. And it would really grow them really well. Like no one's thinking that. That you know, like, they are the heroes. They're like, hey, kid, you're here. Sure, I'll teach you a thing or two, but I'm the one that's going to do this. I'm the freaking hero until yeah. it's like, oh, crap. Yeah, I now have to kill myself. And the only way that I can succeed. In, and that's really like, that's the other way is the kid literally is just the kid. And it's it's the hero trying to do what he, he's trying to do. And he actually does succeed. He fights this monster. It's basically like a dragon type thing. He needs, it has special blood. And, and anyway, it gets crazy. Um, so he has to kill it. He's trying to, his quest is he's trying to save the life of his child. So he's going after this magical creature because it has magical healing properties and he needs to kill it. And so he does, he succeeds because there's nothing the kid could do to it. It's just that the creature also succeeds. So neither walk out of that uh, yeah. hole. But it's a touching scene. He does what he has to do. Uh, and he's willing to throw his life away because he knows that it's the only way to save his son's life. And so when he's laying there dying, that's when he passes that quest off to the kid. He's like, you're going to finish this for me. My death is not going to be in vain. My child will survive. And so, you know, it's still very selfish for him. Very, he's very much, and, and, you know, the audience wants him to succeed. The audience cares about him succeeding. And so the audience then just buys into that transfer of uh, authorityship of that quest where they're like, yes, now kid, you will do this. You will not let that guy, because I loved him so much. You're not going to let him die in vain. And so now he has to, to, to pick up that mantle and, and go down that path. And it's just, you know, it's one of the, my favorite things that I've written in my career. I just really love how organic it is, how insightful it is, how impactful it is on the readers. And that's what you, you know, that's what you need to be thinking. And, and whether it's a mentor character or anything, you know, you need to be thinking how you make things matter is you make them matter to the reader. Yes. The, yes. I, I completely agree with that. There are a few villains who can be villains of just want to see the world burn. Like I've seen those kinds of villains work. Eh? But if all of your villains are like that, you're going to have a pretty boring story. And if you're like, why is your mentor teaching this farm kid? Why has he agreed to take him on? Why, why does this matter to the mentor? And if your answer is because the plot demands it, then your mentor is a waste of space. It's like, a, you might as well just have a walking computer bank to explain your work. At that yeah. Point. And so many writers do things because the plot needs it. Yeah. And it's not organic. Nothing should be for the plot. Everything should be for the individual motivations of the characters within the story. Yes. And that includes the mentor. And yeah. That's a great place to end that discussion. I think that's it. <laughs> hey guys, Drake here. Thank you so much for listening to Releasing Your Inner Dragon podcast. I hope you're getting a ton of information and maybe even some nuggets of gold that you can take into your own writing to help you on your journey of story creation. A couple things I want to throw at you. First of all, for the first time in years, I am opening myself up to being a private mentor again. If you would like for me to work with you to improve your writing right now, reach out to me. You can either go to my website, maxwellalexanderdrake.com, and send me a contact form or just email me at author at maxadrake.com. Also, as many of you may know, I've been out of the novel game for quite a few years. I was the lead fiction writer for EverQuest Next from Sony. I've been in the movie and TV industry for a few years now, but I am excited to say I'm back into the novel game. I've actually been working on a novel for a little while now, and I'm going to start dropping it on Amazon's Vela. So if you're on that platform, look me up, Maxwell Alexander Drake. Thank you again for listening, and as always, keep writing. Hi guys, this is Marie from Releasing Your Inner Dragon, and I hope you're enjoying the podcast. If you're interested in more content on fantasy world building, head over to YouTube and look up Just In Time Worlds. I release tons of content there. If you'd like to check out my book, The Hidden Blade by Marie M. Mullaney, it is available as an ebook, audiobook, and print book on Amazon. Thanks for listening and see you soon.